Welcome to the Female VC Lab Podcast. I have Jennifer here. Jenny, in one line, give me your name, your title, and the name of your fund. Jennifer Stoykovich, General Partner of Joyful Ventures. Wonderful. So tell me what inspired you to become an investor or a venture capitalist? Should we do the long story or the short story? You can do as long as you like or as short as you like. However you like to do it. As a young child growing up in Canada, I had a little show called Dragon's Den. That was, yeah, so down here at Shark Tank in the U.S., that was my very first ever viewpoint into what a venture capitalist is. Uh, I grew up in a small mm-hmm. farm town of 2,000 people. So mm-hmm. there were no VCs around. <laughs> a lot yeah. of cows and farms. I was about to say, yeah, we had a lot of cows. Our major employer was a Honda plant nearby. So VC was was not in the cards for me, but I was um, very fortunate to be exposed early on to this idea of women in particular. That's something that I think Shark Tank and Dragon's Den has always done well, is having women represented as investors and having good yes. companies. Um, yes. So I went to school and I studied business law and VC, ended up in Silicon Valley and was working for, by my mid twenties, Ron Conway, the godfather of Silicon oh, Valley. Yeah. Ron Conway. Very so cool. Totally happenstance. I ran his startup policy organization for about half a decade. I was very fortunate to learn about what it takes to grow startups, what kills startups in particular, and that kind of led me onto the ultimate path of starting my own fund. Wow, that's great. Thus, Joyful Ventures. Awesome. So what is your investment thesis and kind of the motivation behind your thesis? Yeah, so we are a climate fund that is focused on food technology solutions. Oh, cool. So we are focused on transforming the the way that we eat so that we can reduce carbon emissions. So close to 20% of all greenhouse gas emissions that are created on the planet are created through meat, dairy, and eggs. So we seek to transform that through food solutions. We focus on pre-seed and seed investments. So we're early stage we do between a 500k to a million dollar check and mm-hmm. we look at companies all over the world that are oh, meaningfully wow. focused on improving the way that we eat. Awesome. So do you cover all food at all aspects of food including like the growing of the food? Tell me a little bit more about the areas that you concentrate on in the food creation process. Yeah, absolutely. We do B2B, we do CPG, B2C. Uh, we're focused on what widespread food innovation looks like. So that could be uh, seed genetics, molecular farming, as you mentioned. That could also mm-hmm. be end consumer products like packaged goods at the store. Uh, a lot of B2B technologies that help improve foods, uh, oh, okay. biotechnology as well. We, we definitely invest oh. in uh, biotechnology solutions for the food system, like core ingredients, particularly ingredients that are very high value and very expensive currently in their in the way they're sourced. There are some really promising ways to do that through biotechnology. So we oh, really are a widespread and holistic approach to uh, replacing the key items in the supply chain and how we can move towards what we consider to be a more sustainable food system. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's, no, it's very interesting because I think sometimes we take food that's just there We take it for granted, the fear of evolving and creating a new way to produce it and have people experience it. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. And for folks that are perhaps new to food as an investment thesis in BC, uh, it is one of the largest markets in the entire world, basically second only to energy. And uh, food has tremendous um, impact on the planet from a climate perspective. And so Many of the challenges that we are going to face in food are coming in the near future, like we're talking in the next few years and decades, where there's going to need to be investment into what that widespread innovation could look like. Uh, the food that we eat today will not look like the food in five years, 10 years, and 50 years from now. Um, we are facing a pretty, pretty significant water shortage, particularly here in the United States. It's going to affect what we can grow. So we need to get a lot smarter a lot more innovative of how to make those same products or better products for people to be able to continue to eat the things that they love. Otherwise, they could disappear. That is so interesting. 
So what are you currently learning or listening to or reading these days? Oh, that's a good question. The latest industry that I made myself an expert in, or like the closest thing to an expert, I would say is probably pets. I have been doing oh, yeah, a very pets deep... Is a big one. I've been doing a deep dive into pets. It's been a very fascinating endeavor for me. I think that we think about what we eat and the impact it has, but we don't really think about our cats and dogs. And in the United States, 30% of all meat that's consumed in the entire country is consumed by our pets. Wow. Three zero. That's a big number. It's a very big number. Dogs and cats and other animals. Yeah. That are considered pets. Yeah. In the U.S., our pets, specifically dogs and cats, eat more meat than 97% of countries on the planet. So really big. And and Does that mean our dogs and cats have first world problems as well? I was about to say, we are... Yeah, we are now facing um, an unprecedented dog obesity and heart disease epidemic as a result. Yeah, it's a very interesting category. So that's the one that I think I've been learning about the most lately. In terms of reading, I've been reading a lot of Teddy Roosevelt's old speeches and The Man in the Arena and trying to read a lot about the the last time that our economy and culture was in a similar kind of spot over 100 years ago to it is today. And learning how we got through it then as a society and and how we can take those lessons. That's wonderful. Bonus question. Everyone gets it. In two years, when we're talking, how do you see venture capital and or investing having changed or evolved? In two years' time, I would guess 70% of funds that are available or alive right now will not be alive. I'm hearing that. 70%? Wiped out? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's scary. They're saying that they're saying right now, and NBC reported this, about 70% are considered to be zombie what? funds. Why is that, do you think? A ton of new money was raised in, during the pandemic when yes. you know, ZERP was happening and there was like money flowing. And I think that there was a ton of unqualified VCs that raised funds. It, se- it seemed like everybody and like, their sister was raising a fund during the pandemic. And unfortunately... A lot of people deploy capital during that frothy market of companies that are not going to succeed. And I personally know probably half a dozen funds off the top of my head that are failing to raise their second or third fund and are just basically winding down the funds that they have. So I would say that there will definitely be, there's definitely going to be a massive downturn for. So just like for startups, right? If you're, if you're starting to look at the statistics now, it's, oh, 2023, a lot of stuff failed. I know next year, probably same thing ish. So you see that same kind of effect for funds as well. The fund is a key part of the ecosystem. They're just up the chain. Absolutely. If all those startups fail, they're rolling up into somebody's fund and then the fund subsequently fails. So that's true. That's the thing. It's like, or set of funds, right? Like it could be, it could be like a domino that startup failed, but it had multiple funds invest in there for it's like a domino in that way. Yeah, the the startup in that way, in my opinion, is like the canary in the coal mine of what's to come for, for the VC space. Certainly, there's going to be new VCs that come, but it's a very tough fundraising environment now compared to what it was a couple of years ago. So I think the VCs that do make it and they are deploying capital in two years' time, they're going to be much smaller funds, which is totally okay because the valuations are much smaller now. So it's just all contextual. Yeah. And those that do get through it, I, the funds that I know that are raising right now, which myself am included, we're much, much more guarded with the capital than the funds of a couple as, years ago. As I, we should be. As we should be. Yeah. So I would say we may see deployment periods that are more, that are extended, mm-hmm. a little bit longer deployment period. Um, yes. I, I can tell you personally, Makes I'm sense. definitely, <laughs> I'm taking longer to deploy than we it thought should. for sure. It should actually, because things take time, right? That accelerated, that accelerated deployment period was not helping to foster any startups necessarily. So correct. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, look good for your IRR briefly. Uh, but I don't know that. I mean, I've looked at in the last year, just over a year, I've looked at 350 deals Mm -hmm. and I've cut four checks. So we're about like Makes a one percent, but that's what that's normal. I, I think that's not that's not unusual. Yeah, I think that is the going. I think that's what the 
adages in the industry. I don't think that's what the practical measures were these last few years. Yes, there was a lot of irrational exuberance, and that's what I could irrational oh, yeah. but that is a very kind term i was gonna say that's a nice way to put it but <laughs> that's what it was <laughs> yeah exactly so there definitely was i'm telling I'm t- like there's people that like raise money off google docs without even a deck what what it happened and then the correction yeah exactly yeah we will see we'll see what's to come but i would say those are some of my general predictions for how things will change in two years time Thanks for that. So how do people contact you? Yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in learning more, uh, you can go to uh, my LinkedIn. It's probably my most active page. So uh, look up Jennifer Stoykovich on LinkedIn, or you can go to joyful.vc to either invest or pitch in us. We are still um, taking investments and we are a privacy sick, so I can talk about that publicly. And thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, there's my little SEC note. I am allowed to say yes. that. Thank and, you for uh, the SEC note. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had uh, to get clipped. <laughs> no, so I went. We went through the incorporation like that for a reason. Uh, yeah, makes so sense. we, yeah, so we, yeah, we're still looking at lots and lots of deals and bringing lots of LPs in and uh, building what we believe to be a uh, much better food system. And we think that. In terms of the interest in this space, we're still in early days, which is great because in yeah, 10 years so time, right. when this fund starts to mature, you will see how much the conversation shifts around how we innovate in the way that we eat. It is coming very quickly. I agree. So thank you for very much, Jennifer Stoykovich from Joyful Ventures for thank being so much our for guest me. on the Female VC Lab podcast.